All right. So let me get started. Now I can do today. I can do a proper introduction. <laughs> so I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted that uh, uh, Eric and Alfanan uh, chose an excellent field uh, for this year's uh, summer school, and I'm I'm delighted uh, to be here. <laughs> that too. And uh, and I hope you are inspired to do work in the area. So I know some of you are already, but some of you that are coming from other fields. Um, for further inspiration, I got a picture <clears throat> from 21 years ago. Um, someone you uh, saw present uh, here a, a couple of years ago, who was a student uh, uh, in the uh, workshop in 2001. And I think you can tell it's Paula. She looks the same. <laughs> I know some of you are going to the Dead Sea today, so put a lot of mud as you see. She looks exactly the same as 20 years ago, so <laughs> it seems that it uh, that this mud thing works. Okay. All right, now let me get serious and let me tell you about <clears throat> what I want to talk about today, which is the topic of uh, global value chains. And it's obviously going to connect to many of the things that you've seen already. Um, and I feel like there's a lot in the slides that I can probably uh, breeze through because it connects with things that uh, uh, that some of the folks that came before me spoke, in particular, Lorenzo, uh, but also Isabel to some extent, and obviously also she covered everything. Uh, but I want to motivate it. And, and, you know, I guess what I want you to get out of this lectures uh, is the sense that even though we've learned a lot uh, from research agenda in the last 20 years, I would argue that the so-called workhorse models um, that we're working with um, you know, the Ethan and Corden framework that I'm sure Lorenzo covered and set and out, uh, the Mellitz framework that many of people covered, and Isabel probably sort of gave you at least the empirical underpinnings of it. But these are frameworks that when I look at them, I appreciate them for their beauty. They've been super helpful in understanding many things in the world economy, but there's perhaps a disconnect between how those models are written and things we see in the data that I think are safe. Okay, so the first bit is simply gonna try to kind of motivate this. How do I, where do I come from and why am I sort of thinking about uh, 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 looking at things from a different perspective? So at the very basic level, what I'm going to cover is really motivated by three major developments in the world economy starting in the really late 70s, but more it's the bulk of it is in the 80s, 90s and early 2000s, which is the ICT revolution, uh, deepening of trade liberalization. I'm sure Bob talked a little bit about this. I mean, I think he focused mostly on the WTO, but really the main engine or the main sort of key aspect for the growth of global value chains was regional trade integration. Think about NAFTA, European expansion of the European Union, the Asian FDA, Mercosur, uh, and a third factor, which is politics. Okay, so what do I have in mind with this? Basically, and maybe Eric actually talked about this too in his lecture, which is uh, there was a series of forces that on the one hand pushed firms in the West to seek to demand labor in faraway locations, think about the East. And that was driven by better communication with faraway people and also freer, cheaper flow of goods across very distant locations. And that increase in the demand for foreign labor was coupled by a very massive increase in the supply of foreign labor. What do I mean by that? Think about the fall of the Berlin Wall in Europe, think about Deng Xiaoping uh, opening China in 79. That's basically, it brings hundreds of millions of workers that had been in a different economic system that all of a sudden to become employable from the point of view of the firms in the West. So the combination of these forces basically led to a very stark uh, increase in the extent to which production processes got fragmented across borders. Okay, so rather than in your traditional trade theory model in which you have firms that produce goods, they hire local factors of production and perhaps export those goods. We're in a world in which the goods that get exported very often are just sort of parts of broader uh, production processes, okay? And I'll say much more about that coming up. Now, when you start thinking about this fragmentation of production, this emergence of global value chains, and you wanna think about conceptually, <clears throat> how do we think about this? You're obviously gonna quickly gonna have to do an exercise in abstraction. You need to kind of, you can't really think about, I'm gonna write a model about what Apple does, or I'm gonna write a model of what Toyota does, because you know, there's 
obviously firms, there's a lot of idiosyncrasies in their production processes. So what we're trying to do in this field is to try to get at the essence or some distinctive features of global value chains and build frameworks that can account for these features. And I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you a broader intro, but I'm gonna zoom in on sort of two aspects or, or, or a taxonomy of global value chains that I personally have found useful in sort of organizing my thought on this. And it builds on a paper, uh, it's a nice paper, but I think the best thing in the paper is actually the title, uh, which is thinking about uh, global value chains as falling into one of two uh, uh, types of global value chains, some that are called spiders and some that are called snakes. And here's the economics of spiders and snakes. Okay, so initially I had uh, titled my uh, lectures, the first spiders and then snakes. And uh, Alphanan told me, you might wanna, <laughs> you might wanna put some economics there, not to confuse people, okay? So what are spiders and what are snakes? Uh, let me start with, uh, with pictures. Okay, this is, sometimes it's the best thing is to illustrate what you're trying to do is just to show you what I meant. So I'm gonna start with a spider. Okay, so this is what I would call a spider. This is the boring dreamliner. Um, and, uh, you know, we, why do I use this example? Uh, notably, because when I teach or used to teach undergrads about strategic trade policy, this is the example I would always give, which is Boeing versus Airbus. You have the American producer, the European ones, the subsidies, they're fighting in this sort of duopoly, okay? Now it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that because if you look at the Boeing and the Dreamliner, 70% of the parts of the Dreamliner are actually produced abroad. And many of the parts, if you can read the, the locations, they're actually in Europe, okay? So this is really, is this a US good? Well, it looks more like a global uh, good, okay? Now, why do I call that a spider? Well, a spider is gonna capture a production process <clears throat> that has a, a very natural uh, like center or heart, okay, core, which is the assembly location. Okay, and this, this case is in Everett, uh, Washington State in the US. That's where they put together the screen. But this is what you see is a convergence of parts and components to the assembly plan. And through this lens, the rise of global value chains is a process where the legs of the spider, this sort of parts and components that are converging to the core, they've become longer and longer. And they're now crossing borders. Instead of having the fuselage uh, coming from uh, Georgia and the engine coming from Detroit or something like that, these legs have gotten longer and longer. And now the spider is a global spider. Okay, the legs are actually, the ends of the legs are in other countries. So I'm gonna think in a little bit, I'm gonna develop a framework to think about a model in which maybe assembly is local and then the good might or might not get exported, but actually in producing those goods, there's foreign value added coming to that location. And that's gonna connect a bit with what Lorenzo was talking about. I'm sure he introduced his framework to think about global, global inter, uh, uh, input output links. Okay, so there's gonna be a connection there, but I'm gonna give you perhaps a variant of like a different view of how to think about that a more micro view rather than his macro view. So that's a spider, okay? So now let me show you a snake, okay? So this is a different production process. This is how you produce a microchip, okay? As you know, the basic raw material in microchips is silicon. We call it Silicon Valley for a reason, okay? Now silicon is, is just a, it's a material you can find in many, many places on the earth. But before you can use it for chips, for semiconductors, et cetera, you actually need to clean it, you need to purify it, okay? So there's a process of purification where silicon is taken to some facilities where it gets purified. So there's some of that in Germany. It's a good place to purify things, I guess. Um, but it, it doesn't really happen all over the world. There's sort of some comparative advantage or some reason why this happens in some locations. What comes out of this purification plants is a big, big cylinders of pure silicon. Now you take these big cylinders of silicon and you slice them into disks, okay, wafers. And then you move to wafer fabrication. That's really the core of the industry. This is where this facilities, if you've seen any videos where folks are wearing like this coats and they, they look like astronauts, basically. It's very clean facilities. And that's where you have the process of like printing uh, all the key, sort of key things into the disks. Okay, and then what you walk out of that is not something you put in your phone, it wouldn't fit. It's a very large cylinder, that's a very large disc. So then there's the process of wafer uh, uh, or chip assembly, 
as basically they take these wafers to other locations and those there they're cut and they're put in boxes and they're shipped to the end users which are going to be the cell phone industry electronic i mean now we use chips for everything right so the history of this industry is one where obviously the key was sort of this science behind the etching and all this sort of stuff that don't you know don't ask me any details about it i'm not an engineer but it's sort of stuff that it's high tech people got nobel prizes for the development of these things but at some point they realized gee i mean there's things where we probably want to stay close to home because there's a lot of r d or we need like very skilled workers but you know cutting things and putting them in boxes this is very unskilled labor intensive so why are we doing this here why don't we do that say in singapore first and then when singapore became too expensive go to thailand vietnam and so on and that's exactly what happened it helped the fact that the end users the electronics industry for the reasons i mentioned before had migrated to uh, china for instance so that you know if the end user was here might as well go there before okay? so there's an element of we need to make our ways there anyway um why don't we just move assembly there okay so why do i call it a snake well because unlike the previous example where you had all these things that are converging to assembly this is not like the silicon is converging to the assembly or the cylinders are converging to the assembly there's a whole sequential process that you go through before you get this like the a snake like a more vertical thing where eventually you get to the assembly location okay so conceptually this is somewhat different now you might say yeah but you know there's you know spiders there's snakes but there's the world is some in between right maybe the it's a world of snikers or whatever okay I, I, if you google spider snake combination you actually find there's some animals that i don't know if they're true or not but it's very disgusting so i didn't bring it but in terms of a production process it's this is something that looks like a combination it's a car industry right so the car industry you obviously have assembly there's different parts that are converging to the assembly location you got the engine you got the wheels you got i mean the tires you got uh, uh, the chassis and all this stuff is coming from somewhere but in producing the engine and producing the chassis obviously there's been a sequence of stages to get there so one way to think about it is this is a spider where the legs of the spider they're not um uh they're not legs they're actually snakes okay so it's a spider with snakes as legs or you can think about a snake where each node of the snake is a spider. There's things converging to that node of the snake. Okay, so you can think about combinations of, of, of those things. Okay, so I'm going to come back and <clears throat> leverage that taxonomy to think about distinctive aspects of uh, global value chains. Now, before I get into the theory, <clears throat> you know, a natural reaction is you're showing me three pictures. Okay, what is the, what, you know, is that just three carefully chosen examples of things that look like that? The answer is no, and maybe Lorenzo talked about this, which is by now we have very broad evidence that this is this is something, this is a systematic fact. And ways to quantify this, for instance, work by Johnson and Noguera. Did Lorenzo talk about this? You basically, if you compute, if you use world input output tables, which I'm sure he mentioned, uh, uh, and maybe he talked about how you build them, I'll say a word about that later. You can infer from those world input output tables the extent to which in exporting goods, countries rely on their own local domestic value added or they rely on foreign value added okay and if you compute that you see that if you go back to 1970 <clears throat> obviously the world in 1970 didn't look like in the ricardian model or in the mallet's framework there were already a non-trivial amount of foreign value added embodied in exports okay that's about seven eight percent okay but what you have observed in this period, particularly in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, which is uh, when all these forces that I was talking about were really taking off, is a fairly substantial decline <coughs> in uh, the extent to which exports reflect domestic value added. So the counterpart is an increase in foreign value added. Another way to look at that is to compute, again, with world input output tables and 25 pages of matrix algebra, which I spared you. Um, you can compute the share of world trade that is what one might call global value chain trade, which is value added that crosses at least two borders. Okay, if you think about Ricardian models or Mallet's framework, uh, 
you produce locally, you export. There's only one border crossing. Okay, it is only when you import stuff, and then you embody that what you imported in a good that then gets exported. That there's part of that output of that exports that are actually crossing through borders. And by this measure, um, at some point uh, before the great financial crisis, we reached over fifty percent of world trade. That is um, that is uh, GDC trade. Okay. And again, uh, you know, I'll come back to this later, but perhaps this is not surprising in the sense that although maybe there's many, many companies that are still following more traditional methods of production, we know there's a lot of granularity in the data. I'm sure Isabel talked a lot about this. And I'm gonna show you that this fairly small set of very large global firms, they do a lot of this. So in aggregate, this ends up aggregating very quickly to a big, big chunk of the world economy, okay? Uh, not, yes. And that picture seems to be a significant yeah. decline between one ten and one fifteen. Yes. So I'll come back. I I will come back to that. This is something that was left from yesterday uh, lecture, which is I was planning on spending a few minutes talking about what some people call deglobalization. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you see it particularly starkly here. Data ends in two thousand fifteen. We we haven't updated this data. We, when you look at similar measures of globalization, uh, but simpler ones, we can actually get up to last year, which is say the ratio of world trade to world GDP. You observe this and then it sort of stabilizes. Mm -hmm. So I'm personally not too convinced that there's enough power to conclude that we're necessarily deglobalizing, but here's um, um, quite stark. And uh, let me say it up front. Uh, there's a very simple explanation for this. That's not the that is not the China, the US China trade war. And this precedes the, yeah, exactly. This is largely China. This is largely China moving, what we say, moving up the value chain. That is, instead of just being an assembly location where everything was brought in, think about the cell phones where they just brought in everything, they just put it together. There was a purposeful, um, you know, uh, push and, you know, it's not just all government or obviously the skill levels increased in a way that allowed them to get a bit more comparative advantage in higher up stages. So that's going to look like deglobalizing. Okay. Whether that's deglobalizing, that's really deglobalization, or that's really just China developing, it's a different, it's a different matter. Okay. So um, uh, but that that would explain as people that have shown that would actually explain a big chunk of this. Okay. Is your purpose today to explain spiders and snakes? Yes. So I'm I'm going to what the purpose today. I'm going to get to that into slide. I know I'm, I'm being a bit slow, but I'm going I'm going to uh, tell you how to think about those in a framework, how it connects to other frameworks you've seen, and I'm going to try to convince you that I'm not just reinventing the wheel or sort of changing terminology, um, just relabeling things. That there's actually some insights of these models that are new and that might be uh, of relevance. So that's the goal. Um, let me say one more thing that is uh, uh, orthogonal to the lecture today, but that I, um, I, I always, you know, this goes back to my PhD thesis, so I always want to reflect this, which is another so notable fact or another way to look at this is if you look at world trade, um, but let's look at US trade in particular, if you look at the extent to which world trade is transacted between individuals that are part of different firms, or they're transacted within the boundaries of multinational companies. For the same reason that multinationals have grown a lot, they spend many countries, you see that in aggregate data too, in that about 50% of US imports are transacted within firm boundaries, okay? So that on the one hand, it gives you a sense that multinationals in US trade must be very important if about 50% of the value of what we imported to the US is actually coming from entities that are affiliated with the importers. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, I also, I mean, maybe a bit provocatively, but, you know, we praise the David Ricardo, the concept of comparative advantage and how the market mechanism is behind this notion that um, specialization is a good thing. You know, when you look at US imports, 50% of the value of those imports, firms are choosing to bypass the market mechanism. Okay, so that's something to have you think about. Okay, conceptual issues. So let me take stock, okay? And then move on to frameworks, which is what do I take out of this? Many things of which I'm gonna focus on a subset. First input trade is important. 
estimated to be two thirds of world trade. Okay, so this models in which um, firms uh, face demand for their goods and they export those goods and the, they go to consumers. You know, it's one third of world trade. Whether those that means the models are wrong, obviously no. Right? That's not sufficient to kill a model. Is always has to be somewhat unrealistic. Otherwise, it's not a useful model. But you know, two thirds of world trade is goods that are different from how we typically model them. Also, I would argue that uh, if you think about a model of importing, like let's think about spiders, and I'm going to get to that in a second, where firms bring stuff to their assembly location and then produce. In very many, many cases, particularly in the US, but in all, all other countries too, the, 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 the firms that are making those decisions are the importers. Boring is carefully picking the suppliers for their parts and components. The car industry is going and canvassing suppliers. This is a model where I think of it more as a model of selection into importing rather than selection into exporting, which is how we typically model things. Now you might say, who cares, right? You just need to initiate the relationship, but uh, maybe it matters. And I'll get to that in a second. Things I'm gonna be less focused on today, but I've sort of done work uh, is issues of customization. Okay, so and, you know, it connects to the fact that I just showed you, but very often this inputs, you know, the wings of a plane, I mean, you can't just plug it in an Airbus. Um, the chips are customized to the end users. The cars are obviously, the car parts are customized to the end users. These are very often very shallow markets. Okay, so customization uh, is, is, uh, is important. There's important search frictions, there's matching frictions, maybe Alphaman talked about that a little bit. But it's not always easy to find suppliers. You need to incur significant upfront costs to find the right uh, a partner uh, uh, to operate with. And that's actually of relevance for deglobalization. And I, I might say a word on that at the, at the very end today, how I think about this as being relevant for deglobalization. Production processes are often sequential in nature. Have you seen anything like that in this lecture? I'm not so sure, right? But if you think about many production processes, there's natural. Uh, number of stages that the process has to go through and then issues that I'm not going to talk about today but I've done work with which is you know it's not just very customized shallow markets but <clears throat> there's huge contracting issues in international commerce uh, having to do with the lack of sort of supranational courts of law I think maybe Bob, Bob talked about some legal issues maybe more focused on the WTO but uh, in short these firms that are engaging in global operations they find themselves uh, uh, being quite exposed to contractual insecurity, much more so than when firms uh, 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 have domestic things. Okay. So what am I going to do today? <laughs> uh, I, I didn't come just to show you pictures. I promise. Um, I want to focus on. I want to try to tell you what have we learned from studying uh, multi-country models of global value chains. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to develop. You know, obviously, this is going to be focused on my work, but I'm going to try to flag other work, people's work, and avenues for future research. I'm going to first tell you about a model of spiders um, or a paper on spiders, which is the joint work with Teresa Ford and Felix Tentelnot. I'm going to tell you about snakes, how to think about snakes, just joint work with a uh, former student of mine, Alonso de Bortari. And then if there's time, I'm going to give you a taste of ongoing work, which is really trying to combine that into models that are perhaps more reliable because they're not just helpful for thinking about things, but it might be helpful for quantifying things, okay? And in the process, my main goal is not just to tell you what I've done, but just to maybe try to give you ideas on how to push this forward, if you are convinced that there's something here. Any questions? No? Building blocks, everything you've seen, okay? So in, in doing this, I'm going to be touching upon many things that you've seen already, from neoclassical theory, new trade theory, new new trade theory, uh, not today, but you know, if you see the work on this, it's gonna build on incomplete contracting. Uh, uh, Lorenzo, quantitative trade theory. Perhaps you haven't seen an awful lot. I don't know if Isabel talked about this at all, but something that I'm gonna be, that you might have not seen in these lectures yet is structural estimation. And methodologically, perhaps this, I'm gonna focus, I'm gonna pause a little bit more between five and six, because I have strong views on this. Um, on you know what what is the difference and what are the pros and cons of doing one on another? Okay, so I'm um, that's perhaps uh, uh, something to uh, that I want to kind of uh, have you walk out with. Any questions before I get onto the meat of things? Spiders. Okay, so conceptually, let's think about let's push the notion of spiders. Let's push the notion that 
if I see aggregate trade flows across countries, perhaps the, the uh, perhaps uh, thinking about it from the point of view of producers in a country realizing that there's a demand for their goods abroad, making investments to be able to sell those goods abroad, and then aggregated those firm level decisions, which is the you know the core of the methods framework. Perhaps that's not the only way to think about that. Perhaps I observe U.S. imports. And I want to think about U.S. imports as being the aggregation of decisions of firms like uh, Boeing or like Ford that are realizing that there's things they need for production, for assembly that could be produced more cheaply in other places. And they go out there and they find partners and they bring in those parts and components into the U.S. Okay, so I'm going to think about aggregate trade flows as uh, input flows in the most basic version of the model. So I'm gonna shut down final with trade. I'm gonna think about, in the case of the plane, all the, all, all the planes are sold locally to the US, okay? And then I'm gonna work through extensions of that. So it's a, you know, I'm gonna think about things on the import side. And I'm also gonna think about selection into importing, which is if it's a model with heterogeneous firms and selection into participation and trade, I'm gonna focus on these investments to be able to buy it from abroad, okay? And, you know, this is, it's very easy for me to base this modeling choices on descriptive data in the sense of the same way that when you read Malice's work, uh, it very much builds on the uh, uh, sort of descriptive stats that Isabel, I believe, uh, walk you through of a lot of evidence of the importance of the extensive margin of trade the significant heterogeneous in productivity across firms within an industry and how that correlates with participation. All this goes back to Andy Bernard's work and in section five and six of his papers, table seven, eight, nobody gets that far, but he basically shows everything I showed you on the export side. It actually holds on the import side. That is, when I look at US imports, the US imports much more from uh, uh, Canada and Mexico than it imports from Zimbabwe. That's a fact. But perhaps less obviously, the reason for this is not because when firms import, they all go to Canada, Mexico, and they all go to Zimbabwe, but they buy more from Canada and Mexico than from Zimbabwe. No, it's more about the fact there are many more US firms that are importing from Canada and Mexico than there are firms that are importing from Zimbabwe. And conditional on importing, yes, there's some size differences, but they're not all that large. The bulk of the variation is participation, okay? Which is very different from Krugman, from the Krugman framework. So that's true on the import side. And there's also a lot of heterogeneity. If you compare importers to non-importers, they look very different. Just to show you an example of that, um, this is based on US data. If I look at the size premium, okay, how much larger are importers to non versus non-importers and how much larger are firms depending on the number of countries they import from, you see that the more countries a firm imports from, the larger it is. Okay, and this size premium, you need to kind of exponentiate these animals. These are very large size differences. Okay, and they're monotonic in the number of countries that you import. So I'm going to interpret this fact. This is not the only way to interpret this fact, but I'm going to interpret this fact as indicating that if you want to sustain a very complex global value chain that uh, where you're sort of sourcing things from a bunch of countries, it's going to take a large size, large sales, large, large operating profits to be able to make this work, perhaps reflecting the fact that there's significant upfront costs to set up those global value chains. Premium, premium uh, this is basically the, the, it's a Bernard term where you're running a regression of the size of a company on dummy variables. In its simplest way, it's size on a dummy of whether you export or not. So it's like the mean difference in size and log terms between an exporter and a non-exporter. But this is done on the import side. And then instead of a dummy for importing or non-importing, there's dummies for the various number of markets you're importing from. Okay, so this is a dummy. Yeah. What are the numbers on the y-axis? This is the, these are logs. So this would, uh, this basically, you exponentiate this, what's uh, e to the power two is five. But you're, when you're measuring the size of the country, what, what of a company, what, what? Oh, size is sales. sales. Yes, correct, sales. This would be sales. Uh, you could do that with employment. 
Isabel must have shown you this picture. So now where you have size, employment, productivity, and then you run it on dummy variables. Sometimes you put industry fixed effects or not. I forget which one. I mean, we've done it in a variety of ways. Um, and then, but you run log sales. So if you want to get at the absolute size differences, you need to exponentiate this y-axis. Okay, so now, um, okay, what's new here? You might say, you're basically, you might be thinking, you're basically going to take this models of selection into trade, uh, going to think about this firm level decision, you're going to aggregate things up. Uh, that sounds a lot like the Melitz framework. Yeah, you're going to think about the transaction on the import side or the export side, but it's the same transaction. So you're going to be aggregating the same transactions. Why is that going to be, you know, are you just going to be relabeling things? Maybe instead of thinking about this beloved CS aggregator or varieties as a uh, utility function, you're going to tell me that's a production function. And, and then that's it. Well, let me show you how qualitatively, and then I'm going to get into the details, it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. So um, let, let's go back to the Mallet framework. Okay, so you've got demand for your product abroad. Um, you want to sell there because it, particularly with CS preferences, no matter what the cost of selling abroad, you can always charge a price such that the operating profits are going to be positive. Now, the only thing that might lead you not to export is that uh, we think about upfront costs of exporting, which might be fixed, maybe sunk in dynamic models. So there's selection coming from the fixed cost. Okay. But there's a, an assumption we, we don't often appreciate in those models, which is, of course, as in Krugman, these are, what, what are you doing here, Tillman? You've seen this already. You've seen me we give this lecture. Um, I tell the same jokes. <laughs> you still need to laugh. Um, the, there are, of course, models with scale economies, but the, the way we model scale economies uh, is not the Krugman Helpman thing, it's the Krugman way, which is you have scale economies because there's constant marginal costs, but there are fixed costs. So you have declining average costs, but it's the fixed costs are absolutely key for that. Okay, there are constant marginal costs. This is actually very important. If you think about, uh, you know, building on Mallet's Chanet, all these folks that build like this, an estimated multi country uh, models with firm heterogeneity, if you don't have constant marginal costs, you're in trouble. Because the way you solve these models is market by market, you figure out do I want to sell to Belgium or not? And I'm going to look at the operating profits I would get in Belgium. If they're higher than the fixed cost, I'm not going to activate. I'm going to activate Belgium. If not, I'm not going to activate Belgium. Then I'm going to think about France, and I'm going to make that decision. I'm going to think about Germany. But these are one by one, and I can do that because whether I sell to Belgium or not, even though it might affect my scale, has no bearing for the profitability in other markets. That's only going to be true with constant marginal costs. Okay, so that's key actually for tractability in all these models that generate gravity. Uh, yes. Much of the sense of minimization of cost of input just selecting the uh, origin in minimum cost. Pardon me? Does it match with this assumption in the uh, models of the Italian process where they choose the minimum uh, cost origin? Well, I'm going to get to that. Yeah. I'm going to get to that. Wait so for me. Same principle. I'm, sure. okay. I'm coming. Just taking my time, okay. Um, I, I want. I'm gonna get to them all. If you're if you're dying to see a fresh air distribution, it's coming. I promise. Okay. <laughs> I know. I know you have some. Uh, what do you call that? The symptom, the abstinence, or whatever. It's, you really need to see those things. I, it's coming. I just. I want to focus on conceptual aspects first. So uh, the next point is that if you're thinking about importing, you can you can kiss this assumption goodbye, because the reason. Boeing is going to foreign places uh, to buy stuff or firm set up this global value chains is precisely to affect its marginal cost, to reduce its marginal cost. So if a firm goes to China and reduces the cost of a material by bringing something cheaper from China, that obviously is affecting the marginal cost of their production and uh, profits in a way that might shape, if there's fixed cost of importing, their decision to import from other places or other imports. So there's these interdependencies that constant marginal cost shuts down, they immediately arise in a model of spiders, okay, or global sourcing. 
So it's interdependency in the entry decisions. As you were anticipating, what's your name? Evgeny. Evgeny. As Evgeny was uh, anticipating, this is not the only layer of interdependencies. Even leaving aside the extensive margin of trade, if a firm has invested in being able to source inputs from China, from Mexico, from Canada, it still needs to decide for each of the inputs they use in production, where are they gonna source those inputs from? Maybe they went to China, perhaps with the goal of importing a certain part, but once they interacted with firms in China, they realized, look, there's these other guys that can do all these other things. We were buying those things from Canada, but we can actually buy them more cheaply from here. So in choosing where to buy an input from, even after you've incurred this fixed cost, there's a natural competition across input sources uh, in trying to sell to the buyers. Okay, I think that's what you have in mind. Okay, so that's another layer of interdependencies where in models of exporting, you don't have consumers fighting to buy goods. Okay, whereas on importing, the suppliers are competing to sell to you. It's not just about picking where to invest in or where to buy an input, it's just a quantity tool. How many wings should Air, uh, uh, Boeing buy from whatever they were buying the wings from? Well, you know, you need to plane two wings in a plane. So that has to be, it's one-to-one -one with the number of planes you're gonna produce. How many planes are you gonna produce? Well, that's gonna depend on how efficiently you can produce them. That's gonna determine demand, where demand meets supply. So you, it's how much of the inputs you're gonna buy is a function of everything else that's happening in the production process, okay? So, you see, there's a lot of interdependencies, even I'm already simplifying things a lot, but this is a much more complex problem than this one, okay? So, uh, but it's complex in a beautiful way, <laughs> in the sense that we can think about it and perhaps find ways to characterize it and get new insight. And that's what, uh, uh, that's why we uh, did in this paper, okay? So in this paper, um, we develop a multi-country model of global sourcing, um, the backbones of the model go back to my work with Helpman in, in the early 2000s. But in those frameworks, we work with two models. And we thought at some point, gee, you know, maybe the three countries, and we, it was complicated. We didn't know how to do that. So in this framework, we basically, what we did in this paper is uh, borrow some tools from the Eden and Corden framework to actually uh, render this uh, problem more tractable. And then we combine this, this was not sufficient for reasons that have become, become clear to kind of solve the firm level problem. We also had to bring in tools from the industrial organization field to solve this extensive margin problem of, given that the entry decision is interdependent across countries, firms face a very large set of possibilities of where to buy inputs from. So how do you actually solve this problem? It's, it's a combinatorial problem that becomes, you know, if the number of countries is sufficiently large, it's, it becomes very complex. So in the paper, we borrowed tools from IO to kind of devise algorithms that would allow one to solve the problem, actually characterize the problem too, and be able to structurally estimate the model, okay? Find the set of parameters of the model that minimize the distance between the model and the data, and then we can use those for counterfactuals. If you are waiting for me to talk about head algebra, I am not going to talk about head algebra, okay? Because for two reasons. First, because the framework that I'm going to talk about here does not fall under the class of models, doesn't satisfy the conditions that are required for that to work. Um, and second, because I have my qualms about head algebra. Okay? Maybe I'll talk more about that later. But that's not how I like to do empirical work. And then, you know, I'll show you some reduced form evidence if there's time on exactly. I go until 10, 30 or 11, I forget. Okay, good. Um, I'll show you how, um, um, how, you know, some evidence in line with some of the predictions of that. Okay, model. So again, think about trying to have a model that is gonna give you aggregate US imports, but it's gonna solve the problem of a firm that is importing inputs into the US, from various sources for various inputs. And then I'm gonna aggregate that and get something that I might wanna match with aggregate US imports, okay? On the preference side, I'm gonna think about a, sorry, I'm gonna think about a model with many countries, J countries, and the empirical applications, we have 66 countries or 67. 
there's a set of individuals uh, that uh, consume and uh, supply labor uh, inelastically uh, um, uh, in each country. They like manufacturing goods. Okay, they spend a share of their income on manufacturing goods. A remaining share of their income goes to things that are on, you know, an outside sector. Okay, so we we are not going to have a full general equilibrium model. We're going to think about the manufacturing sector actually facing a perfectly elastic supply of labor. I'm a trade economist, so I sign a pledge to use Dixit Stiglitz preferences. Uh, although Mark's going to tell you that, I don't know. If, yeah, Mark will surely talk about deviations from that. Um, and did anybody else depart from CS preferences in his lectures? Helpman did. Okay. Yes. See? So the motivation for uh, preference, it's, it's, it's preferences on the consumer side, it's much more broad than what players think the motivation on the production side. So this is the, so let me give you a cheap answer, which is this is the demand side. On the supply side, which I'm about to introduce it, um, there are um, two ways to think about that at least. Um, the first one would be love of variety, okay? Would be, this is how Bill Ethier um, interpreted this, which is, it, it is a reduced form for the gains from specialization. If you kind of break a production process into more and more things, a more variety of inputs, each of the input suppliers is going to be more specialized. So you're going to have higher productivity in the same way that Dixit Stiglitz is associated with a higher uh, utility gain from more varieties. That's one way to think about it, but it's reduced form because we are not modeling how specialization is actually fostering uh, productivity. But that goes back at least to Ethier. Um, Another reduced form way, uh, people think about that uh, in terms of what we call Armington preferences or Armington differentiation, which is, um, which is, uh, um, is going to be an isomorphism between what I'm going to do and, and, and that model, which is that inputs are differentiated by country of origin. Okay, so wine, in the same way that Chilean wine, you know, uh, Merlot from Chile and a Merlot from France, your French friends will tell you they're not perfect substitutes. The Chilean French would tell you they are, but the French would tell you they're not. For inputs, there's perhaps a sense that there's some differentiation by country of origin. That may or may not be compelling. Okay, I agree with that. But it, uh, perhaps one way to think about it is a reduced form for diversification or something like that, where maybe if you buy from more sources, you might get a, a profit gain that might have to do with that. Okay. Profit gain because you are, you are better and shorter. Yeah, but it's all reduced form because obviously there's no uncertainty. Okay, so I'm not, you know, it's not fully satisfactory. But the, um, you know, I, I mean, I maybe I could say, look, the ethier thing is as reduced form as Dixit Cyclitz is, in the sense that this is not a Lancaster type model where we have a very good sense of why yeah, variety is good. Right. On the production side, it's, it's, uh, it's requires. It's, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's people invoke Smith and the gains from specialization and so on. But and there might be people that have formalized this actually. That's a good. It's a definitely a good question. Okay. So, but this for now is just um, obviously the you know, <coughs> model has a demand has a demand side has a final good side. Uh, but that's going to be a bit of a sideshow in the sense that I'm more going to be more focused on how these final goods are produced using inputs that are coming from a different sector. Okay, so, but the final goods sector is going to be a mallet style framework uh, setup where there's heterogeneous firms, there's an endogenous measure of producers, there's going to be free entry, um, there's going to be heterogeneity in terms of core productivity. Okay, and I'm call calling this core productivity because marginal costs. They're not just going to be a function of this and wages, but they're obviously going to be a function of the sourcing strategy for the firms. Downstream, we're going to have monopolistic competition. And I'm going to assume for now that the final good is non tradable. Um, that is, the planes are not exported. We can relax that, but it's simpler to focus on this case okay. for now. Now, if this final good sector used labor supplied inelastically by these guys to produce, and this was the only sector, 
this would be exactly the closed economy version of the Mallet's framework. Exactly. Okay. That's not what we're going to do here. In, in what way? Instead of having the final goods produced with labor, we're going to have the final goods produced with inputs. That is, firms are going to use a unit measure of uh, intermediate inputs. Okay. And that's going to be coming. Uh, I'm going to give you the technology in the next slide. Um, so I guess another answer to your question is we're actually not invoking that. Uh, we have CS, but not law for variety upstream. Okay? Um, and why do we use CS? Just to reduce the set of parameters that are in the ground. Um, but obviously that's unrealistic as my friends in the IO field are always telling. So each firm is going to be able to buy these inputs, not just from their local market, but there's going to be some potential suppliers of these inputs in foreign places. But in order to be able to learn about the existence of the suppliers and their productivity, firms are going to have to activate those markets. They're not going to have to maybe go there, send someone there, learn about it, and then be able to operate. So there's going to be fixed costs, but not on the export side of marketing, because there's no exporting of final goods, but on the import side and finding suppliers. Once you pay this fixed cost, that's going to define what we call the sourcing strategy of the firm, which is going to be the set of countries out of all J countries in the world in which the, country, the firm has invested in being able to buy inputs from. To bring the inputs from the J sourcing locations to the I uh, origin country where the firm is assembling the good, you're going to incur trade costs, which are going to be iceberg in nature. Um, and then we're also going to make the assumption for reasons that are going to become clearer now in a second, which is the upstream sector, we're going to assume it's perfectly competitive. Okay, there's a weird asymmetry. This is monopolistically competitive. This is perfectly competitive. This was a simpler way to kind of get tractability. And one of the extensions I'll talk about is what if you relax that assumption? And then you introduce monopolistic competition here. You introduce endogenous measure of suppliers, variety of effects, and all this stuff that you're talking about. Okay, so we don't have it here, but you could plug it in if you want. Uh, the, number of sources, the, number of <coughs> the, pot the potential side you're choosing from? Yes, it's J. There's a world with J countries. And even if J is uh, my favorite country in the world, Andorra, you could go there and source from Andorra. We're not going to have that in the application, but the number of nodes that I could activate is that fixed. I'm thinking that if this was a different choice for me, so if I was only allowed to source from one country, the problem would probably would be a bit simpler because then it won't be a combination of the Yeah, but the, but I, yes, you could do that. But you know, I'm going to show you in the data that well, I showed you that already, which is I don't like that model because of this, because I observed firms. Some firms are sourcing from many, many, many countries, and they're huge. So these guys are going to matter a lot for aggregates. And that's going to be endogenous? Yes, exactly. So that's going to be how you solve for the extensive margin. Um, and when we estimate things, we're going to estimate the marginal cost parameters and fixed cost parameters that are going to best fit the data. Okay. Um, what if I had 25 for the first set that are imported from some set countries? I have 25 different goods that I'm choosing the best suppliers. Okay. So I have 24 prices. But that's the exact, I mean, in a way, that's what we're going to do. Yeah, there's no problem with that. I'm just wondering whether that problem would be simpler because then I have 25 inputs and I'm choosing the best. Yeah, well, I'm pretty sure that would not be simpler. Um, I think the continuum assumption. Uh, for smoothing things out, and I'll get to that in a second. That's going to allow me to borrow uh, the discrete choice techniques and sort of invoke some law of large numbers to simplify matters. If I wouldn't be able to do that in that case. I could, okay, so let me put it maybe computationally, there's a, there might be a, a way to kind of simplify things computationally. But before I get to the estimation, I'm actually going to squeeze some juice out of the model, some sort of insights that regardless of the application are gonna come out of the model. And that would be very hard uh, if I did what you're saying. Um, okay, you're with me? That's the model basically, okay? Yes. Can you maintain another structure for the 
apart from the process of speaking in English. Like having one of the competition or only competition. Monopolistic competition, I'm pretty sure. I think we had an appendix. And I'll, that's one of the extensions and uh, it's tractable and I'll tell you what, what it adds to that we're sort of leaving under the rug here. Oligopolistic stuff, uh, you'll tell me about that. I mean, that's a little bit harder, right? Um, maybe, you know, Atkinson and Burstein type of apparatus, uh, uh, maybe. But, um, and there's actually, yeah, there's some work, that, ongoing work, uh, trying to kind of think about oligopolistic structures. But I, even though I'm convinced that's very, very important, I, I'm not going to say much about it. Today. Okay, so now let me put a bit more structure. Um, if one of some of you wanted to see the CES, then here you go. That's the first fix. First fix of the day is your CES production technology. So that's the marginal cost of the farm. Um, remember, fee is the core productivity. So higher fee means uh, lower marginal cost. Okay. But the marginal cost is not just this sense of wage rate, which would be if you hire labor, but the marginal cost is uh, shaped by the prices that you paid for all the inputs that you use in production. The inputs is a measure one of them and they're indexed by V. Okay, the different inputs are V and the price you pay for mark for input V when the assembly is in country I is this object here, which is a function of the country J where that particular input V um, uh, is originating from, okay? Now I told you uh, before that the upstream market is perfectly competitive and there's marginal cost pricing. So if that upstream sector uses labor in production, that's the only factor of production in the model, okay? And the technology is linear in labor, I can replace that price by the following object, which is a price that is linear in the wage rate in country J where input V is produced. It's magnified by the trade cost between uh, J and I, the iceberg trade cost. And then there's um, this term AJV of V, which is the unit labor requirement of producing input V in market J of V. If we need two workers to produce input V in country J of V, that's gonna be two times the wage rate. And then this term, which is higher than one, which is uh, uh, you know, to account for melting and transit in the, of the iceberg trade, okay? So basically my marginal cost is gonna be a function of the wages, the technology and the geography, how costly it is to bring stuff from country J when I bring all these things to I to aggregate them into this final. Okay. So that's the terminology, say, in Dixit, uh, sorry, in uh, Dornbush, Fisher, and Samuelson. I think Alfheim talked about this, like we started with uh, DFS, uh, Dornbush, Fisher, Samuelson, and uh, how do we go to three countries, four countries? The field was stuck. We didn't know how to track to be deal with that, okay? And along came Eaton and Cordham and say, said, look, if you wanna understand, I'm gonna take a bit of a detour here, but if you wanna understand why, you know, Ukraine grows potatoes and, you know, France sells cheese and you really wanna understand comparative advantage at the product level, um, you really wanna dig deep into this technologies or what determines comparative advantage. But if you are a macroeconomist, for instance, like John Eaton was, and you want to understand aggregate trade patterns across countries and maybe make sense of the gravity equation, maybe it's not so important to understand which particular goods you have comparative advantage. You just want to have a framework that through comparative advantage generates specialization and trade flows. And in that case, perhaps there's no need to characterize the equilibrium of the model as a function of this A's this vector of A's, or in this case, this infinitely dimensional vector of, of A's, maybe you can project those A's into some distribution and then characterize the equilibrium of the model as a function of the parameters of the distribution rather than the actual vectors. Okay. So that's one way to think about Eaton and Cordham. And then that's the Eaton side of things. And then the, what's the Cordham side of things? I'm making this up, by the way. Okay, so you can ask them. Yeah, you, can, you can ask them. The Cordham side of things is he came from, you know, an IO setting or IO field. He knew about discrete choice models. And this guy's understood, Sam, I think, understood that we can think about trade 
in two ways. We can think about it on the supply side, which is what we typically do. Countries are good at this and they're not that good at this and that's what generates why some exports, some others. But you can also think of from it on the demand side, which is I'm a consumer in Spain and I can buy goods from this country or from that country. I can buy cheese from France or I can buy cheese from Spain locally. I can buy cheese from Portugal. Suppose cheese is homogeneous and then I'm just gonna figure out where I can get it more cheaply from. So this is a problem where I'm trying to minimize the price that I paid for what I want to consume. And Sam and John realized that sounds like what McFadden was all about, which is McFadden was trying to figure out, say, the San Francisco rail system or the, the transport system wanted to figure out, you know, there's folks that need to get from A to B. They can take the train, they can take the bus, they can drive, and everybody's going to minimize the cost to get from A to B. Just a second. Um, and there's going to be some outcome of that. And if you want to try to understand why Mr. Smith took the bus to go from A to B, or why Mrs. Johnson walked, you know, that, that might be an idea. Uh, there might be a lot of noise, might be that Ms. Johnson likes to walk and the other guy doesn't have a car. But if, if you're the transport authority, maybe you don't care about Ms. Johnson per se or Mr. Smith. You just want to understand what share of people are going to do this or that. And for that, McFadden showed us how to, you know, modeling the idiosyncratic noise in a particularly suitable way through extreme value distributions actually led to very simple ways to characterize aggregates. Okay, so that's where the fresh is coming from. It's not that this guy just opened a stats textbook on the right page and like, let's try this. You know, this is not how things work. That's a obvious intellectual history behind the fresh distribution. There. But to use the example you were just referring to. The cheese really is homogeneous. Yes. And I have to pay a fixed cost every time I'm in a new country. Why don't I just buy all my cheese from one country and say that fixed cost? Like that? Yes, you would. And, and that's why it's going to be important that there are multiple, multiple inputs. And the way that we're going to think about this here is I pay a fixed cost to be able to buy not just cheese from France, but once I go to France, I might understand hey, the wine is not half bad. Maybe I'm going to source some of the wine. I mean, this is a consumer side, but for inputs, it's the same, which is you pay a fixed cost and then you have access, you're going to have access to the full vector of it. And then for some, you're going to say, no, I'm better off with what I already had. But you might actually realize that there's more than what you uh, thought. The cheese, that, yeah. the cheese itself. The, the cheese itself is homogeneous. Yes, right. exactly. And it's going to be bought from this. Correct. Right. And that's why exactly input by input, I'm going to choose the minimum of this. And that's where the fresh air is going to come in because I want to characterize where the dust, dust is going to settle in a problem where firms are input by input choosing something that minimizes the draw of some sort of joint distribution. So, so Alhan, you had a question? No. no? Okay. So that's here you have fresh air. Okay. <laughs> so that's exact. No, that's what they show this uh, uh, one of. Uh, extreme value distribution that is actually going to do the trick that's going to be very tractable in characterizing what comes out of this minimization problem. And instead of carrying around uh, this very heavy uh, a vector of draws, we're essentially going to have one vector of parameters, the TJs, which is the state of technology in country J, and a, an additional parameter of theta that is uh, inversely related to variance. So the T is basically, if you think about it, the higher a T is, on average, the lower are going to be the unit labor requirements, which means that the higher is productivity going to be. Okay, so countries like Germany that might have very high T's. On average, if you go to those countries, you're going to find that, um, you know, labor efficiency, labor productivity is very high. Obviously, wages might be high too, so that doesn't mean that you're going to buy everything from Germany. Okay, but on efficiency grounds, they're going to look good. Countries with low T's are going to tend to have higher A's. Okay. Theta is basically, again, you're getting draws for all the Vs, right? So if theta were to be very high, the dispersion of those draws would be smaller, which would imply that if Germany has better technology than Spain, um, it would have better draws for just about any V. Instead, if theta is uh, lower, there's gonna be more dispersion, 
And even a country like Spain or Zimbabwe, for some Vs, might actually have surprisingly low waves. Okay, and that's why in these models, the lower is theta, the higher the variance, the more you're gonna have specialization because even low technology countries are gonna be really good at some things. And in this setting, even low technology countries are gonna be particularly good at producing some inputs that some firms in the US are gonna to wanna to import. Okay, once they've invested in learning about the productivity of that country. Pros and cons. The pros, this is gonna be tractable. Okay, and it's gonna to lead to very simple expressions for firm level import volumes from various countries conditional on uh, having invested in importing from those countries. What are the cons? In the Boeing case, I'm gonna be able to have a model that's gonna predict in dollar terms, the share of imports of Boeing from various markets. But don't ask me where the wings are coming from or where the engine is coming from. That's not the model to think about that because it, I'm basically, these are like the, the wings are Ms. Johnson and the engine is Mr. Smith. That's not what the model is meant to explain, okay? You could do nested structures to get at things like that, but I'm, I'm not gonna do that here. So what comes out of that, of the Frische distribution is in the same way that uh, Eaton and Quorum derived a gravity equation of trade at the macro level, how much country I imports from country J, I'm gonna get at the firm level, how much firm fee in country I, where I'm indexing the firm by its productivity, how much firm with productivity fee in country I, how much it imports from J, okay? Um, and that's relative to all their input purchases. What's the percentage of their input purchases that are originating in J? That's the ratio of two objects on the, the numerator you have the state of technology of country J, trade cost between I and J and wage in country J. So you're gonna to tend to buy less from countries with higher wages, more distant countries or countries that it takes a higher transport cost to bring back to I, you're gonna import more from better technology. Hopefully it's not my body. <laughs> Uh, there might be people with the uh, hold on. I think Shay is, uh, is administrator for the for the session, and uh, he should be able to mute. I don't know if you can mute him from your side, but Shay is the administrator. Yeah, I think they went to find him. Yes. Okay. Yes, that seemed to work. Okay. Perfect. So that's the numerator, and the help I, is on the way. I think we're good. What? Pardon me? Did you mute your computer? I don't think I did. Do you guys hear me out there? Okay. Yes, there you are. Yes. Thank you. So um, that's the numerator. Okay, and it's the same numerator as as an Indian quarter, right? It's exactly the same thing. The denominator, it's similar. It's 
the same, but it's different. Okay, so um, uh, it's again as an internet quorum, it's going to be the sum of these objects across all sourcing locations. What's different, however, is that you're aggregating over an endogenous number of countries. Okay, so think about a firm that is sourcing that is small and it's not sourcing from any other country in the world. It's just sourcing from the US. So the share of purchases from the US, this better be one, right? So it's that implies that the denominator should only have the US, that's why you have one. If you're importing from the US and Mexico, it's gonna be the share of coming from Mexico is gonna be this term for Mexico divided by the sum of this term for Mexico plus this term for the US. Okay, so in either in court that denominator is always J, the set of countries in the world, for firms that are selecting into that are endogenously choosing the set of countries they want to buy from, the denominator is endogenous. So we call the numerator in the paper, we call it the sourcing potential of country J. And notice that it's independent of the firm. Okay, that obviously the firm might realize different draws and things like that, but uh, because that we have a continuum of them, that's your question, all this is going to wash out. So this shares at the firm level, they're all going to look the same, conditional on the same sourcing strategy. Okay, is that going to be true in the data? No, of course not. Okay, so that way, there's obviously scope for kind of improving things, but it's sort of a useful, uh, uh, a useful sort of uh, 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 trick. Now, and the denominator we're going to call that is really a firm level thing. We're going to call the sourcing capability of the firm, and notice that the more countries the firm adds to its sourcing strategy, the larger is the sourcing capability. We get just adding terms, okay? Now the sourcing capability turns out to be a very important object for the firm level problem, because you may remember from Eton and everybody remembers this from Eton and Corda, that you get gravity. What people sometimes don't remember is that's a second absolutely beautiful thing that comes out of the Frechet, which is absolutely key for their welfare formula and then you know Arcolakis, Costino Rodriguez Clare, which is that this denominator in their framework is also a sufficient statistic for welfare, for the price index in their model. In our case, the denominator turns out to be a sufficient statistic for the marginal cost of production of the firm. Okay, yes, obviously fee matters too, but remember I started with a very complicated infinitely dimensional, you know, a, a, a marginal cost of a function of like a continuum of draws and all that stuff. And now I've told you, if a firm has invested in sourcing from country A, B, C, and D, if I know this country level terms and I know their fee, I can give you their marginal cost, okay? So that's basically simplifying a lot, the sort of things that if I'm trying to estimate the model, I'm gonna to have to estimate those, okay? So the higher the sourcing capability, the more countries I've invested in buying inputs from, the lower the marginal cost uh, is gonna be. Oops. So now I have the marginal cost. Now I know for firm fee based in country I that has invested in a given sourcing strategy, I have a formula for their marginal cost. Now remember downstream, I have Dixit Stiglitz which means that, and there's monopolistic competition. So I'm charging a constant markup, markup over marginal cost, moving from marginal cost to profits, operating profits, very easy. Uh, I have like downward sloping demand with constant elasticity. Uh, this looks a bit complicated, but that's what you would expect, which is I'm gonna have a profit function where operating profits are gonna be a power function of my core productivity. Then there's gonna be a term related to my sourcing capability, which I had in the previous slide, to some power that is gonna be partly shaped by uh, the demand elasticity downstream and by this exponent I had here, okay? Now, I've changed a bit the notation. Some of you look like we're frowning. Yes, there's eyes. What are these eyes, right? I think Marek was looking at these eyes. What are these eyes? These are indicator functions because I'm not just writing the profits, but I'm laying out a profit maximization problem where the firm is optimally deciding which countries to activate as sourcing locations is a zero one decisions where the benefit of activating a country is clear, which is it increases my sourcing capability, uh, reduces my marginal cost, increases my profits. The cost is that there are fixed costs of activating this sourcing locations. Okay, so that's the trade off 
that the firm is facing once it's focusing on its extensive margin decision. Okay. Now you look at this and you might say, well, that gosh, that looks complicated, right? Because as opposed to a mallet style framework where firms are activating exporting in locations, and I told you that these decisions are independent across export markets. The reason for that in terms of the profit function is that in that model, the profit function is linearly or additively separable across sources. So I have a profit chunk for France, for Germany, for Belgium, there's additive separability. I do not have additive separability here, except for a knife edge case in which sigma minus one is equal to theta, okay? And that goes back to this idea that there's no additive separability because if I activate China, that affects my marginal cost, it affects my scale, affects my profits, and might affect my decision to select into importing from third markets, okay? So that's a problem of turning J01 decisions, which my daughter can solve, to a case where you're choosing to activate or not uh, J locations, and those things are interdependent. So you're really choosing a set. You're choosing a set of countries out of two to the power J uh, locations, uh, uh, potential combinations of those countries. So if J is two, that's four. If J is three, J is four, my daughter can solve this. If J is five, it's a bit more complicated. If J is seven, not even Eric can solve this. I mean, seven maybe. Eight, that's a little it's more complicated, okay? And if J is over 13, not even like the best computer in the world can solve this. Yes? I know because I haven't told you, I can't repeat it. I can tell you what it is. Uh, BI is gonna come from, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's the residual demand level that the firm faces. Uh, basically, if you start with Dixit Stiglitz preferences, your demand is gonna be, is gonna, is gonna fall with prices with a constant elasticity, but there's an intercept in that demand schedule. That intercept is a function of the share of spending, aggregate spending in the sector, divided by the price index. And I'm just reducing that to a term, which I'm calling BI. Okay, so it's endogenous to the model. When I solve a free entry downstream, uh, that's an endogenous object. But from the point of view of the firm, because it's a continuum of firms in the industry, the firm can treat that as given because it cannot affect the price index in the downstream sector. Um, that, but that's a, that's, a good, that's a good catch. I didn't tell you what that is. Okay, so it's a complicated problem, but I'm gonna do two things in the next few minutes, which is first, I'm gonna tell you that even if I cannot solve this problem, that doesn't mean I cannot characterize it. Okay, we have monotone comparative statics tool to characterize problems. We cannot actually, we don't need to solve them. And second, I can also leverage those techniques to actually devise algorithms to actually solve this problem in and, and, and finite time. So do you have any idea how firms solve this problem? Uh, they do. <laughs> uh, that's fair. So that we, I'm going to get, you know, that's in the next lecture, I'm, I'm going to talk a bit more about this too, which is there's been a very active literature trying to solve these very complex problems and finding ways to find the optimum. Now that begs the question, if I go to a procurement department in one of these large companies, it's probably staffed by OR folks, they're engineers. And engineers, they approach these things in a different way than we do, which is they maybe understand they're not fully optimizing. Maybe they um, sort of using some algorithms to try to kill some things and they know they're, it's not exactly optimum, but it's close enough to be optimum. So I, I think that's, you know, I, I have students that are thinking about these things and maybe, maybe that's how we want to model it because that's what actually firms that what they're solving, they're not fully, rational or they're not like fully optimizing. Um, and that's, there might be a simpler way to solve that. But beyond that, I don't have much to say. That's a good, definitely good question. They never read this paper. So maybe if they read it, they, <laughs> they'll, uh, I'm not sure they'll love CS preferences though. <laughs> okay, so if you characterize this problem, let me show you a couple of results that come out of it. So first one is, uh, it's kind of simple, which is if, um, 
you know, you can see that no matter what I choose this, there's lux supermodularity between core productivity and this object. So even though I, I cannot be sure that larger companies are necessarily going to activate more countries, it could be that for some configuration of parameters, you could have a very large company that uh, uh, activates a market that reduces the marginal cost a lot, and that might actually lead them to not want to uh, shore from anywhere else. Although, you know, there's no necessarily that monotonicity. I do know that more, more productive firms in a core productivity sense are going to end up with weekly higher levels for this sum, which means that global sourcing is going to magnify the underlying size differences that would emerge from core productivity. It's going to magnify them. So the large guys are going to get even larger. That's for sure. Okay, even though I, without knowing exactly what they do. The second set of results are going to come from noticing that this function is not just uh, not additively separable, but it's it's not it's not separable in an interesting way, which is there's really only two cases here. There's a case in which this exponent is higher than one, and a case in which this exponent is lower than one. In the case in which it's higher than one, we're in a situation where this sourcing decisions are complements. If I activate China, that can only increase the marginal benefit of if sourcing from Mexico. If sigma minus one is less than theta, we're in a substitute case. When I source from China, that can only reduce the marginal benefit of sourcing from Mexico. In the latter case, I may end up with the situations that I mentioned before, where a large company sources from China, because China is a high fixed cost location, but it reduces your marginal cost a lot, and that's all they do. And then you have another firm that cannot make China work, they go to Mexico, but maybe they go to Mexico and to Costa Rica, and then they end up with two sourcing locations versus a larger one. But if sigma minus one is higher than theta, that cannot happen. In a sigma minus one higher than theta, which is the empirically, empirically plausible scenario, we argue in the paper, you have complementarity. And the model tells you there that larger firms, if they all face the same fixed cost, larger companies should be sourcing from more markets than smaller companies, which is what you see in the data. In fact, if the fixed costs are common across firms, there's a strict hierarchical order. Firms would all want to go from the to the most appealing location, and then larger companies are going to source from the same countries as smaller companies, and perhaps some more. It's a strict order. Which do we see that in the data? No. Okay, so. That is something that we actually tackle in the paper. When we go to the empirical version of the model, we are going to introduce front level fixed costs. There's going to be some heterogeneity in the fixed costs to be able to account for the fact that uh, we observe things that otherwise the model cannot explain. That connects with Eden Quartum and Kramars and their econometric paper, if you know that. Okay. So in the complements case, we get this complementarities and this sort of this packing order and this sort of natural correlation between number of sourcing countries and productivity, we also get this result, which is particularly useful in the, um, in the estimation, which hints at an algorithm that's going to allow you to solve this problem. And let me just tell you how the algorithm works, and you can read the, the, uh, the more details in the paper. But suppose I'm a firm and I'm trying to figure out what's my optimal sourcing strategy. I have two, two I have 65 countries. So in principle, I would need to optimize over two to the power of 65 countries. But suppose I have complementary. Okay. Sigma minus one is higher than theta. So suppose I do this. I suppose the fixed cost of sourcing from the US is zero. So all firms source from the US. That's what we see in the data. Uh, they all use some inputs. And now I think about one country at a time. I'm going to think about, am I going to add Mexico or not? So I'm going to compare the profits when I only source from Mexico, so from the US, I'm going to add Mexico here and the fixed cost of Mexico, and I'm going to see whether profits have gone up or not. Okay, I'm going to do that for Mexico. I'm going to do that for Canada, but one at a time. Okay, I can do 65 computations. If I um, find that any of the 65 countries increases your profits, this result implies that that country is for sure going to be your sourcing strategy. Because in the worst case scenario, it is profitable. So it could be that I add Mexico, and the actual optimal sourcing strategy is US, Mexico, and three other countries. 
But if Mexico is profitable when only the US is in, sure, it's going to be profitable when in addition, three other countries are in. So I can safely keep Mexico. Now, I don't, I, I'm not going to stop there, right? Because it could be that in the first round, I only added Mexico. But now I, I'm going to do, let's start with US and Mexico, because I know Mexico is in. And I'm going to reevaluate all the other countries. And it could be the case that China wasn't profitable with just US and Mexico. Sorry, with just US, but when we have US and Mexico, maybe now China is profitable. And if it's profitable, I can safely add it in. So that's going to give me, you know, I'm going to do that. I'm going to get stuck at some point. But every single country I've added for sure is in the sourcing strategy. Now I'm going to go to the other side. I'm going to say, suppose I assume that I'm sourcing from everywhere. I have all the countries. And now I think about dropping one at a time. Suppose I have 65 countries in my sourcing strategy. And I said, let me see what would happen if I dropped Honduras. OK. Would that increase my profits? If it does, if I only drop Honduras and that increases my profits, I can forget about Honduras. Because if it's not profitable when all the other countries are in, surely it's not profitable in any other scenario. And then I can get rid of a bunch of countries. But I don't need to stop there. Because if I got rid of Honduras, which I know is not in the sourcing strategy, I can then reevaluate other countries. Now that Honduras is not in and I will have dropped 10 other countries, I can iterate that. That's giving me two bounds. Okay. And in many applications, those bounds are sufficiently tight that even if I don't converge to the optimum, I can then use the computer. In fact, in our application, you end up with most, the bounds are like at most eight, 12 combinations or things like that. So it actually, there's a scope for dramatically reducing the damage of the trial. And that I would say, I, I want to emphasize this is really tied to monotonicity, increasing differences of the profit function. In our paper, we said, okay, this is increasing differences. Uh, Panagia had a paper in econometrica that had used a similar algorithm. There's later work by our colleagues, Eckert and she that has shown that it doesn't need to be increasing differences. There's algorithms that actually work with decreasing differences. As long as you have monotone differences in the profit function, there's scope for solving this problem. Yeah. Yes. Um, with that particular modularity, can we solve these problems with managing coefficients? Maybe not solve it, but like the other function. Partial managed by. Yeah, I don't know, actually. I, I, it's. Um, I guess so. I mean, I haven't thought about it in this scenario. I mean, I know student of mine, Eduardo Morales, had a thesis on the export, um, focus on exporting. And it was a setting with interdependencies, uh, but through the fixed cost, right? They had a model where firms um, decide the markets where they export, but he sort of, you know, realized the obvious thing that if I export to France, uh, and I'm packaging things in French, the fixed cost of selling in Belgium or in other French speaking countries is actually lower, right? There's a natural complementarities on the fixed cost. And he sort of implemented a moment inequality model to kind of deal with. So probably you're right that there's a way to kind of import this, this tools here, but I haven't thought too much about that. Okay, so that's one set of results is more in the paper, just how you can exploit monotone comparative statics to kind of characterize the problem. There's also some interesting comparative statics that uh, we later validate in a, a reduced form way, which is there's this sort of funny things that come out of the model, which is if I hold a residual demand constant, okay, and suppose that I reduce the marginal cost of importing from one country like China, there's a China shock, their productivity increases or trade costs decline, and it's cheaper to buy from China. Your natural uh, sense is that this is going to be awful for Mexico. Mexico had signed NAFTA, and then all of a sudden China comes in and sort of eats out everything that they were selling to the US. Not so obvious, right? At the firm level, these firms, by reducing the marginal cost of sourcing from China, that is leading to a reduction in the marginal cost of firms. If this firm is buying from Mexico, the increase in the productivity of this firm, the increase in the optimal scale of that firm might actually increase the demand for Mexican inputs. And if sigma minus one is higher than theta, this latter force dominates, okay? So we're saying that China shock, for instance, and in the empirics, that's what we do, perhaps overall is bad for US manufacturing and sort of it took market share away from Mexico, but this has to work through the extensive margin, not through the intensive margin. The firms 
that were sourcing already in those markets, and if they were sourcing in, in China, the marginal cost reductions in China actually led, if anything, led to an increase in sourcing from those third markets. And that's exactly what we see uh, in the empirics. Um, this is the summer workshop on economic theory, right? So I can go very quickly over the empirics, uh, 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 um, but it's, uh, I encourage you to look at it. What we do then is we, we take the model to the data uh, with uh, US census coupled with import uh, transaction level data. So we have the universe of US importers. There's a lot of selection, only about a quarter of firms import. Um, and, you know, we have a bunch of sort of descriptive stats on, on what those firms do. And we focus on an empirical application with 66 countries plus the US. Um, that's actually a constraint. It's really in, a, in part computational, but it's really more about disclosure. They wouldn't let us go to smaller countries. Um, and then there's some reduced from data that looks at small stuff. Just a couple of descriptive stats. Um, this is to show you that firms actually import a lot of products. Some firms uh, import a, a lot of products from other countries. Um, they, on average, import from 3.25 countries. Uh, but obviously, there's a lot of dispersion. And the medium company is actually not importing from an awful lot of countries, okay? at least directly. We could get into indirect importing. Another fact that I think I, I usually don't show it, but I think it's very timely now. Uh, and I may come back to it in the second part, which is there's very little diversification. If I look at the number of countries that firm imports per product, the product is defined as an HS10 product, you just don't see US firms buying, importing the same good from more than one country. Okay. So whether that's optimal or not, I think Alhanan talked a little bit about that. You know, is this, are we find ourselves in trouble because of this, where firms not optimizing? In any case, it's very clear that the median firm has zero diversification. So if there's a flood in this place or there's a lockdown in this place, you do not, you are not able to import that good. And whether they had a substitute in the US, that we don't observe. We don't have that, that detailed US data, but there's, that's interesting. And I would say, well, perhaps it's not surprising which is not surprising because there are fixed costs to setting up the strategies. Of course, firms would wanna have 10 suppliers to provide them the same thing just in case, but it's costly to do that. You need to you know, build this, you know, uh, you know, you need to invest in, in, in specialized machinery, build trust, a bunch of things that take time and resources to do, okay? We, we did get a, uh, a stylized fact Earlier lecture that when the pandemic hits, there were a bunch of firms that were able to buy multiple systems. Who showed you this? Isabel? Isabel? I'm surprised to hear that. That's not, yeah, I, I, I should ask her. That's not what I would have expected. Um, anyway, so structural estimation, you can look at the details, but basically, the structure we imposed in the framework is very helpful in backing out uh, objects um, from the data. So the sourcing potentials of countries, turns out that you can back them out from gravity equation like specifications where you're trying to predict from level imports on country fixed effects. So the country fixed effects, there's a one-to-one -one mapping with those. So we can get that very easy if you have the micro level data, obviously. Then we back out sigma from markups. Theta we estimate by projecting the sourcing capabilities on wage differences across countries. That tells us that uh, trade elasticity of import shares at the firm level is only wages. And then we implement the algorithm that I mentioned before to simulate the model of firm level decisions, aggregate them up uh, at the country level. So we have import shares from various markets. And essentially what the model is gonna tell us is given the sourcing uh, uh, potential, so we backed out from the fixed effects, what kind of fixed costs do we need to have in the data to be able to make sense of the shares of spending from various countries? So just to give you one example, China is out here. China is out here in that the sourcing potential is very high. Why? Because conditional importing from China, we observe firms buy a lot from China. So that means that when I activate China, the numerator must be very large, okay? But given that very high numerator, there has to be a high fixed cost of sourcing from China because I don't observe a lot of companies sourcing from China. There has to be something pulling them back. 
Okay. There's, in fact, many more countries importing, many more firms importing from Canada than they're importing from China. So it has to be that this is a higher fix in our model. Our model is going to load that on the fixed cost. Okay. And that's how we get this estimate. You estimate the model. Now you can play with it. You can do counterfactuals, and I'm going to let you look at that on your own. Uh, but that's what we did. Let me take a break here and then pick it up next in half an hour. Thank you. Thank you. The snakes is next, yes. I mean, I have to be maybe even you have the AIDS thing for it. Yeah, I could. Sorry. Yeah, I could. Yeah, I'm sorry. 
They're doing this uh, inside it uh, on the top of the train. Oh, yeah. I'm the picture. yeah. Oh. I mean, it's partially like a little bit. But, but they're trying to think about market power and parking. Yeah. 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 Subsidy, right? So in this model, the entry you know, upstream 
you enter, it, your entry creates productivity effects, and you're going to try to internalize the other part of it, not down it. So he shows, and, and, and we kind of agree with that, that you can only, if you are fully accepted somewhere, you want to put it upstream. But um, if you have a whole vector of subtree, it's a little bit more challenging because you really need to be in a second best zone. You know, where you're not really there, and then, you know, given that you're trying to live with some other thing, then, then all this machinery stuff is going to happen. So, um, we discussed the something I was working on uh, with that other system. You know, it's sort of the loose stuff is a little bit more subtle, right? Okay. This was when you first said that you wanted to make a Well, uh, happy to talk, but I also need a 